Welcome back from afternoon tea. Uh, so Christopher Biggs has been into open systems since the 90s and is now the principal at Accelerando Cons uh, Consulting. He's going to show us how his team works exclusively in Elm while having access to the JavaScript ecosystem with Elm by example, make beautiful map displays with Elm and Leaflet. Please make Chris feel welcome. Hi, thank you for coming along. As, uh as the introducer says, I've, I've, I've been around for a while. Um, and what, what I do is I help business use technology to reduce stress. And that's, that's really what I believe, that technology is the gradual process of freeing human, humanity from drudgery and fear. Now, what stresses me out is front-end programming. Um, like many highly technical people, elegance does not come naturally to me. So today I want to talk about how those of us who don't live and breathe user experience can still build pleasant user interfaces with a minimum of fuss, without having to learn a billion different JavaScript tools and frameworks, but still have access to some very sophisticated and stylish interface elements. My desire to tell you all this comes from pragmatism. I started working life as a C coder, and you'd think that means I'd be safe from having to write web pages, but not so much. I spent a total of uh, nearly a decade over a couple of roles writing web interfaces in C. Um, it wasn't pretty, and the web pages weren't particularly pretty either. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible to write good looking web pages in low level languages, um, but I sure can't. Um, so as soon as I could, I convinced both of those workplaces to move to more appropriate platforms. So in one case, we wrote a Java applet just before that became apparent to, that it was a really bad idea. And the second time around, we moved to PHP right around the time that cloud systems and sophisticated JavaScript frameworks uh, signed the death knell for server-side templating. So now JavaScript is where it's at. Um, I've said before that JavaScript isn't perhaps the language that we would have liked to become the universal lingua franca, but it's the one we got. The good news is that the additions to JavaScript in terms of power and scope and pleasantness to work in um, over the last five years or so have been remarkable. Uh, but the tools, huge dependency graphs, version conflicts, complicated build processes, packing, pa packaging systems that would make Escher dizzy. So a couple of years ago, I heard about Elm, a nice, simple, functional language that compiles to JavaScript, has a friendly tool chain that does its best to help you out with com comprehensible error messages. Yeah, right, I thought. Nice toy language, useless. Um, I saw a presentation at Yale conference in 2016 from Jessica Kerr, uh, where she builds a simple user interface as a live demo over the course of 40 minutes, and that looked kind of fun. So I put it on my, my someday maybe list. And last year, I consulted on a project involving indoor location data. Picture the Marauder's Map from the Harry Potter books. I wanted to do a, a quick proof of concept, really just to confirm that the data I was getting from these sensors made sense. So I took an opportunity to write it in Elm to see what was possible. And this is not the talk where I tell you that the clouds parted and a great beam of light shone down upon the land and rainbows formed and unicorns frolicked and programmers everywhere forgot how to swear. This was my first pure functional language and nothing made sense for about a week. Uh, there are easier things to learn, even though Elm's documentation, tutorials and books and community are all excellent. Uh, but I've seen things in my journey through JavaScript, folks. Class hierarchies where it's hunt the code beneath the wrappers. Abstraction layer cakes so deep you need scuba gear. Code that prioritizes testable over comprehensible or fixable. But when people set out to create a simple tool that writes all the wrongs of the world and brings pro program in Nirvana, I often find a tool that you get a tool that is beautiful, but too beautiful to persist in the real world. If you want to live in Shangri-La, you're told that you can never have any contact with the outside world. So what would a tool look like that lets you do real work, but at least smells a little bit of unicorn? I'm going to do you the credit of presuming that you've at least heard of reactive programming. A lot of our problems as programmers stem from unexpected change. Safe use of multi-threading is hard. Handling exceptions and pointer types is hard. Variable aliasing and uninitialized values are a pain. So Elm's goal is to contain the danger safely. 
And by danger, I mean you, the carbon impurity at the front of the keyboard. In Elm, you have exactly one variable, your model. Events from the outside world change your model, and the model reacts to those changes. You don't have to worry about updating the screen because the language handles it for you. Each time the model changes, your view routine is called, and then the language runtime efficiently updates the document object to render the new view. So back to that rapid prototype. We have a building and a bunch of floor plans, and we want to show the locations of people and machines. Really, we're only tracking the machines, but we're taking the shortcut of presuming that many of these machines, the ones we call telephones, are suckered onto people much of the time. Now, Elm really encourages you to refactor constantly and to start with the simplest possible model that expresses your problem. And this is a really close match to how I work in any case uh, with a series of exploratory prototypes. So I find this approach rather pleasant. Sorry about the commas in the code layout. You'll have to get used to those. Elm folks like to line things up like that. Um, and while it's not totally essential, it sort of makes sense after a while. Um, so this is my model, all of it, at the end of day two. Um, day one was even simpler. I have a building. It has floors. Floors have maps. We expect the user to, to select one particular floor that they're interested in. And we start out with no floor selected, so we use a little prompt in place of the name. And that's cheating, but I'll come back to that later. Of course, our model needs to change. Our functional programs consist of inputs and outputs, otherwise they're, ju they're just constants. In Elm, we define in advance what inputs we'll process. We do that by defining one type called message, which is the union of all the possible things we know how to process. The Elm runtime calls our update function with a message object whenever it has input for us. Our update function is typically going to then use that input to modify the model in some way and possibly return a command along with the altered model, which is a way to send messages back to the outside world. Um, we don't need to do a command to render our view, once again, because the runtime does that for us. Now, our view function, which gets invoked whenever the model changes, um, is responsible for presenting our, our model to the browser as HTML. We don't have to care about which part of the screen needs to be updated. We simply render everything into a virtual document, and the runtime takes care of efficiently working out what's changed and putting it into the real view. And that sounds insane, I know, but it, it works, and I've never had any performance problems from it. Uh, I realise that if you don't already know Elm, I'm going ridiculously too fast for you. Um, I'm, but I'm not trying to teach you the language here. Just take a lap around the block. Um, if you do want to learn Elm, um, I do recommend that you watch uh, Jessitron's video, which I will link to at the end. Now, before I said that our model update can return a command along with the new model. This is the way, besides the view, that we can talk to the outside world. A common example here is here where we're making an API call to get our, our map data. We're invoking a HTTP request and passing two critical pieces of information. First, a response parser, which is, a, is that expect JSON function plus a description of the format of the expected JSON data. And secondly, that got floors argument there is the message that we will pass back to our update function. So what happens here is the Elm runtime constructs a HTTP request, sends it, passes the result to a parser, and then passes the output of that parser as a message back to our update function. One last detail on those updates. Of course, interactions with the outside world could result in errors. And when this is possible, we declare our response message as a union type, typically our expected result along with some kind of error. And the benefit of that is that the compiler will enforce that we're always dealing with all the possible type values. So that this is part of Elm's boast that you will never see a runtime error. It's not bulletproof, but it's pretty close. Of course, sometimes you are reduced to begging the compiler for mercy because you have to handle all the possible types um, whenever you're dereferencing a value. And this use of types as a, as a software quality enforcement permeates Elm. Uh, I told you that I cheated earlier when I made the default floor selection a prompt string. I, have, I've tried to put, I had to put something there because I declared it as a string. Um, so it has to contain a string. Now, if I tried to put a null in there, it wouldn't compile. An empty string would work, but that would be cheating even worse. So the way you express optional data in Elm is with a union type consisting of a null and something else. And this is so common that there's a mechanism for it 
that Elm calls the maybe type. A maybe type is something that can be either null or just a value. And whenever you're dealing with any maybe type, the compiler makes you explicitly say what happens when you get nothing. Once again, that can be infuriating, but it becomes second nature after not very long. So in our mapping example, the, w the way that we handle the possible selection of a, of a map to view is to have a type switch. If there's no selection, we show a prompt, and if there is, we show what's selected. And our switch lets us declare a new name for that safety checked value so that once we've done that safety check, we can use that and not have to redo it, but also not have the risk of accidentally tripping over a null. Now, before we move on to the meat of this talk, I want to come back to one last thing of the nasty cheats I snuck past you. Did anyone catch me hard coding the URL of my API? That's not going to fly in production. Uh, but I wouldn't want to hard code a production URL where developers might be calling it either. And typically in a web programming um, environment, your web server passes that kind of information to your application as environmental template variables. And Elm has a mechanism for this too, which it calls flags. And once again, they're strongly typed. So when you declare a model, you can declare that it accepts flags and what the names and types of those flags are. Then your build process or your web server arranges to pass those flags to the Elm runtime when it's created. Um, here I'm using an embedded web server written in Go, so I'm using Go's templating language, but it could come from, from any similar mechanism in other systems. So over the course of a week or so, my little user interface grows from a couple of buttons and a map uh, to a complete application with dialogues and toolbars and icons and searching and, and hooks into the cloud provider's authentication system. But I had help because Elm has uh, over 900 community packages containing libraries to do pretty much everything from video games to a complete implementation of Google's uh, UI toolkit that you might recognize from websites like uh, Google Maps or Gmail. And Elm's modules are another way of keeping the risky parts of your program as small as possible. And that includes user input. A web programming language that doesn't respond to user input isn't particularly useful. Uh, the way that you accept input in Elm is by declaring a message type that encodes the information that you care about. And now in our view, we can declare user interface elements that emit messages. So here we have a menu button which, which sends a message with the name of the selection. And that's going to arrive in our update function and alter our state, which will then affect our view. So everything you do in Elm consists of a round trip between putting something in a view, receiving a response message from it, updating the model, which creates a new view. And there are other kinds of inputs besides users, of course. The, the mechanism for these is called subscriptions. And you name a subscription that you want to receive, and then tell at the runtime the message that you want that subscription to send you. Um, so then these system inputs, such as window size changes, or timer alarms, or WebSocket input, um, will drop into your update function just like everything else. So that's a lightning tour of the ARM architecture and I wouldn't forgive you in the slightest if your head was spinning. Now, I told you that story to tell you this one. Sooner or later, you'll want to do something for which there is no library in ELM. So you've got two choices. You can write an ELM library if you're an ELM guru, or you can adopt a non-ELM library and, and punch a hole through the walls of the functional reality bubble to let your um, Elm code interacts with the great unwashed JavaScript space. And Elm being pragmatic uh, provides a way to do that as safely as possible. Elm defines a mechanism called ports, which are another kind of subscription and message combination. But instead of the interaction between be being between your Elm code and the user, it's via um, your Elm code and some other JavaScript library. And if you've programmed in Go, this is very similar to the channel uh, communication mechanism that they have there. Ports let us interact with any piece of non-ELM code that we want to use, but give the best effort to ensure safe values. We can't protect against outside libraries doing crazy stuff, but we can make sure that if things go splatter, we don't get um, any of it on us. So, with the inexplicable xenophobia affecting the United Kingdom, it has come to the attention of the authorities that there is a completely undocumented population of wombles inhabiting the United Kingdom. 
Um, and what's worse, it believed that they may be immigrants given the large number of Eastern European names used by these creatures. So the opportunity arose to implement a global Womble registration and tracking system. It seems that no matter how, how fast I run, evil catches up with me. Now, this is not actually what I'm doing, but that's what I'm allowed to tell you about what I'm doing. So, now Accelerando has accepted a com commission to expand our Marauders map from a building to a whole country. And this isn't Shangri-La, so people can leave the country and maybe they'll be some anywhere in the world. Uh, and maybe we won't, we won't want to know about that because we're creepy and we have boundary issues. So along with some remedial ethics training, uh, I'm going to need some kick-ass grade mapping technology. Uh, and it'll probably be really expensive and take a cost of Brazilian dollars and be super hard to learn. Not so much. So this is Leaflet. And how much code do I need to display a globally scrollable and zoomable street map and put markers on it representing using object, moving objects. Well, you're looking at it about that much, and it's free. Um, but this is a plain JavaScript library, and I want to talk to it from my Elm unicorn bubble. So before I talk to more about that, I'm just going to go through some of the terms um, that Leaflet uses uh, that you'll need to know about. So we live on a round planet. Most of us accept that, apart from a small minority. So we describe points on the surface of a sphere using latitude and longitude, these we call coordinates. And for the purpose of, of, of rendering maps onto a two-dimensional screen, we kind of gloss over that and, and simply flatten everything out and divide the surface of the planet up into squares. And we call these tiles. And there are a number of tile services that you can buy access to that will give you maps at whatever resolution you want. So if you think about Google Maps, when you're zooming in and out, you often see little square, gray squares as it's redrawing. Each one of those squares is a, is a separate tile which is being individually fetched by the browser. And then we put points of interest on our map. So we have points that we can say, put a marker here, and then we can put some kind of object alongside that marker, like an arrow or a little piece of text. And then finally, if we're doing navigation, we might have a series of points connected into a line that represents the route that we're going to travel or, or something like that. So here's about the simplest possible way to send information outside the bubble. Um, what we do here is we define a port that carries strings and we send a string through it. And the string in this case happens to be a bit of JSON, um, which I, I simply encode in the Elm. Um, and it's the received by JavaScript, which decodes it. So in our JavaScript code, we supply a callback for each channel, for each port, um, and we have some confidence that only the expected types will appear. Now, the drawback of doing what I just did there, of defining a, a port as a string and encoding everything into, into JSON strings, is that um, we have, we have very loose typing, uh, all sorts of unexpected things could sneak through. And I'll come back to a better way to do it later on. But first I want to show you how the communications happens in the other direction. So back the other way from JavaScript into Elm, uh, once again we define a port and we, we use the subscription mechanism to say what information we expect to come in. In the JavaScript code, we simply have a function that is a, m a member of our application object that we can call in order to send information into the port. So finally, um, we look at a better way to do it, which is with strong typing, where instead of defining one port that we put everything through, we think about all the possible user interactions that we could have. So this could be um, requesting that uh, we show the map for a particular location, or uh, showing a marker for a particular object, or in the other direction from JavaScript back to Elm, it may be the user clicked on a map location, or the user zoomed to the map, or some other piece of JavaScript added more elements to the map overlay, and we want to know about the changes to the map overlay. So in our, 
in our ELM code, um, we can send messages out through a port to control an embedded leaflet map. From our leaflet map, we have information coming back in. And that entire demo there that shows fetching um, a population information from an API, um, selecting locations, zooming to them, um, is about um, 150 lines of Elm code, a couple of pages of code. Um, and it took you know, half a day to, to figure that out. Um, and the good thing for me is that the whole thing compiled up um, is about 65k. Uh, that's compressed. It's, it's a couple hundred k after that. But the benefit of this kind of thing is we can put these user interfaces, nice, rich, non-horrible user interfaces, into embedded devices, into mobile applications. Um, these user interfaces can also be completely responsive, so they work on phones. So if you are a person who, who do, doesn't consider yourself a front-end programmer, who wants to be able to produce serviceable user interfaces with a minimum of fuss, without having to go and learn every framework under the sun, I encourage you to give this technology a try and um, see what you can do with it. So to, to recap what I've talked about, um, what drove me to look at Elm was, was the horror of the amount of learning and the amount of uh, storage and the amount of um, time required to learn a larger framework. Um, I do like the idea of functional programming and I was very pleasantly surprised to see that um, practicality is a, is a, is a prime um, desideratum of Elm. Um, we've talked about some basic principles of mapping. I've shown you um, the core concepts of leaflet and how to um, how to control maps um, and what kind of things you can do. And we've talked about how to use ports to communicate between your Elm program and any other JavaScript libraries that we have. So thank you for listening to all that. Um, and we do have quite a bit of time for questions. Um, and I'm here for the rest of the week if anyone wants to corner me and, and find out more. So over to you. Thank you.